I think one of the greatest fallacies that we share is that communication is key. And communication is the key. And then you're like, well, there's a lot of bad communication out there. I think that saying communication is key is identical to saying like, oh, the key to good art is paint. It's like, no, paint is the medium. It's how you use it. It's the skill that it's, it's actually um, utilized that makes something good or bad. And so not all communication is good communication. It is a skill that you have to learn, something that you have to work at. I mean, you don't just wake up having the language to express yourself perfectly. So if you're not great right now, that's okay. You can practice, you can get better at it. There's definitely a learning curve and I am a product of that 1000%. You're listening to the Almost 30 Podcast hosted by Krista Williams and Lindsay Simsek. Almost 30 started as a conversation about the transition from our 20s to our 30s. But then we realized life is full of transitions. So we expanded our mission. We are an intuition-led, wellness-focused lifestyle podcast that promises to deliver authentic conversations, diverse points of view, and insights rooted in optimism, growth, and intention. The Almost 30 Nation community is a group of purposeful dreamers who are smart, passionate, and always seeking the full potential in every aspect of their lives. At Almost 30, we're making magic together. We dream it, and then we do it. Thanks so much for tuning into the Almost 30 Podcast. Here we go. Hello and welcome back to Almost 30 Podcast. If you're new, welcome. Hello, everyone. Greetings. It's Lindsay and Krista, your uh, besties, best friends in your ears. We're happy to be here with you. Support you, laugh with you, make you feel a little less alone. We have really honest sometimes wild conversations every single week, twice a week. Um, We do an interview on Tuesdays with a guest. And then on Thursdays, you get to catch up with us. What was that review we just read? It was the sweetest review. And she's like, at first, I was a little uncomfortable with their sharing. (laughs) Awkward sharing. (laughs) Yeah, honestly. (laughs) She was like, you know, they're amazing. But at first, I was a little uncomfortable with their... It was like almost like oversharing. I do think we've come a long way. Although I know there are people out there that appreciate when we overshare. But I specifically remember sharing about like blowjobs and shit. Yeah, at the beginning. You know? know? Like just... We're ladies now. We're... Yeah. I'm a lady. (laughs) I'm a lady. It is true, but it is when people see in the big, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. You're like, what do you mean? I was, I, I mean, I was single for most of this time. So I kind of felt free to do whatever the fuck. Of course. And I think like if you're in a relationship, you kind of have to like, I can't. You can't talk about dick sucking. Yep. Nope. <laughs> no slob knobbing. So I'm just keeping it, keeping it real quiet. And I wish we could keep going with dick sucking. Ways and, to say I know it. me too. Slob nobbin. Slob nobbin. Um, I just, <laughs> yeah, also too, I don't know if anyone feels like this when you're in a long-term relationship. There isn't, yeah, I guess it's just like, like there's not much to say, but it just kind of evolves beyond the physical as much. Mm-hmm. You know, at the beginning, it's everything. It's, you know, all connections, but the physical is so fucking present. But after seven or eight years, the physical is always there, but it's so much like more of like a, partner bond. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? For sure. And it's fucking hilarious. Like, it's hard to, like, be, like, a freak with someone that you, like, joke with every day. Mm -hmm. I was, like, watching this. I was listening to this Oprah thing, and she was talking about one time with Stedman. She's like, yeah, I put on this black lingerie set, and I was, like, waiting on the stairs when he came home. And Stedman walked by and said, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's like that. It's like when you are a certain way with someone, it's hard to kind of go back and revert and be like, yeah, baby. You know, like kind of talk dirty. Yeah. They're like, what? <laughs> totally. You're like, who are you? Totally. I, uh, yeah, I think with the long distance thing, it has forced me to not depend on the physical. Because I feel like if I was in the same city with someone I was dating and could see them more than once a week, it would be mainly like, obviously you probably have sex when you see them or at least that's what I was doing. (laughs) And I would almost... Great ladies. (laughs) Come on. Do you hear me? (laughs) I I would depend on that expressing myself physically to convince them to <laughs> like me. <laughs> totally. So it's kind of nice. And I've known, you know, Sean for a long time. So it's it doesn't feel um, unfamiliar. But yeah, just it's so much 
deeper. It's mm-hmm. just when you get to like be, become close to someone without the physical all the time. Yeah. hundred percent. Feels good. And how are our, how our are single them? single girls yeah, out there? How are the sing gals? Sing gals. We're that what start a, yeah, we're days? gonna we're gonna start a new podcast called <laughs> Sing Gals. And our alter ego, our alter egos that are single. It just rolls off the tongue. I know Sing Gals is actually <laughs> amazing. And I want to create like a fucking jean jacket with Sing Gal on the back. Um, but yeah, you were single this time last year. Mm-hmm. I actually don't remember what I did. I think you went to Hotel Joaquin. Probably. Because I had him check on you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's usually my MO. Yeah, birthdays and 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 uh, Valentine's Day, I usually go somewhere by myself. I don't know. I, and it's not sad. It wasn't sad. I always just yeah. kind of like to like be alone on occasions like that, at least for a little bit, just, just to kind of check in with me. Because like, I'm sure you all can relate. Like on those certain days, people are like, so what are you doing? So what are you doing? So what are you doing for your birthday? What are you doing for Valentine's Day? Blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's like you want to have a plan, but I but on I don't, your own terms. Yeah, on my own terms. Yes. Like I don't, I don't know because you don't want to be like I don't know because then they're like, well, we should, and then it's like I don't yeah. want to. <laughs> I don't like you that much. I don't want to. <laughs> oh my gosh, um, Matthew McConaughey made an Instagram. It I love is so insane. It's terrifying. Where'd that come from? There's <laughs> this is where I'm bringing it back. So I'm looping it back, you guys. So so right now we're talking about Matthew McConaughey's Instagram. But you said check it in with me in mm. one of his posts. He's like. I'm checking in with the M and the E. He's like, I got, he's like looking in the mirror, kind wow. of talking to the camera. It's him. kind of like Kevin Spacey-ish. It's like, I got to be checking in with the M and the E. And it's very like country. It's like he's doing a character. It's bizarre. I love him. It's like, it's like he's been in Hollywood so long, he doesn't know when to like not act. Mm. <laughs> or he's just like pulling one on all of us. It, he can pull. You well, know what I yeah, mean? 100%. I feel like if I had that many people following me, I would just have a blast being a fucking weirdo all the time. Yeah, Not that's give true. A shit. But but this is the thing. Why? Why? Because it's hilarious. But why would you even be on Instagram if you're like that famous? I think there's a part of him or maybe his manager says, you got to stay relevant. Oh, let me find the video, you guys. It's actually the funniest thing on officially McConaughey. Okay. <laughs> Ready? When people come to my page, I want them to see see me. Um, look, this is my first venture into sharing myself and my views with the world, and I'm a little bit nervous about it. Um, You're like posting selfies. Because, quite you frankly, you're not sharing I, your views. I like. I know I want to have a monologue. I'm not sure I want to have the dialogue. <laughs> But I've learned that you got to have the dialogue to Dude. have the monologue, just as you have to have a monologue to have. The dialogue. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to uh, sharing who I am with you. I'm looking forward to seeing if uh, if who I am translates. If what I want to share translates. Translates. It tells your funny bone. If it makes you think a second. Makes your heart swell up a little bit. Oh. If it makes you take a quiet moment for a walk and go, I got to check in with the M and the E. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Dude. Let's have some fun with there, that let's, let's Thanks, see, McConaughey. Let's the high eye, not the low eye. High eye. There. What? There is nothing more Matthew McConaughey than two things. Saying, quite frankly, and the whistles in the... Yes. Make you take a quiet second. A second to just wait. That is... I love him. Makes you take a quiet second. Makes you... So weird. Checking in with the M and the A. Like, all you're posting is like a picture, literally like a selfie of you with your gin that you made. It's not making me check in much. (laughs) Yeah. Got to stay relevant. I honestly think it's his manager saying, yeah. Matthew, I'm sorry. You got to get on Instagram. Yeah, 100%. He literally like hang, probably hangs out in his barn all day and his manager <laughs> knocked on it and was like, Matthew, you have it. to get on Instagram. If you want to promote your gin, like you got to start it. <laughs> you know. Checking in with M&A. So I don't know how we got there, but that's well, how we did. For all you sing gals, check in with the M and the E. Yes, that's the point of this. <laughs> you guys got to check in with M and the E. Yeah, I think it's important because honestly, if you are kind of in the space where you do want to call in a partner, I think it's important. Like that, that's literally what I feel like I did sort of maybe for the better part of those six years where I really got used to and, and began to very much love my time alone. And it, there was something that happened where the moment, the months where I was like, damn, I'm good. 
was when like things started to happen. I was like, oh, this is kind of it. Because then you start to attract the person that kind of sees you in your independence and you're able to kind of dance together as individuals rather than like codependent. 100%. You come in as an independent person. Mm -hmm. And then as a person that's been dating a while on Valentine's Day, it means uh, absolutely nothing to me. Yeah, not to be cruel and unusual. Yeah. I got tickets to a concert for Justin, so I think we're going to go to a concert on Sunday, which will be oh, fun. Oh, cool! Yeah, what concert? Uh, Diggable Planets. Totally. It's like an old. <laughs> I know. It's like an old hip hop cool. group. And I, when I first met him, I was in the back of a four by of a forerunner in Alabama when I had visited him at college or met him at college. Oh yeah. And he was like, his friend was like, "Dude, Krista knows all the best groups." And he's like, like what? And I was like, named like these people. And one of them, I said, Diggable Planets. He was like, oh, <laughs> isn't that funny? It's like That's old. Cute. It's just cute and fun. That's really fun. So I told him, I'm like, hey, Sunday night, we're going to a concert. Like FYI, you better do something. You know, like I'm oh. doing something. So you better do something. Totally. Well, I think it's, it's a classic move. Fun too, to like be able to plan, each plan something. 100%. I think that's so fun. He'll plan. It's adorable. He'll plan your one. He'll plan everyone because he knows that's your, your jam. Sean's coming out here, so we're going to do nothing. Just look at each other. Just <laughs> touch just each other. Fucking look at each other. So that'll be fun. He was actually at the show. So was Justin mm-hmm. that we put on in LA and are going to share with you today. Our LA live show with special guest, Shan Boudram. Such a blast. This was so much fun. Lindsay and I kind of did like a set at the beginning. We talked a lot about our dating life which was hilarious and fun. So that's at the beginning. And then we go into a fun conversation with Shan. She is a sexologist, relationship expert, and one of our favorite people. So it was really fun to just dig into her about all things relationships. So you will get the the behind-the-scenes live show experience with Almost 30 with Shan, which is so much fun. Yeah, and we're really excited. In um, the later part of this year, we will be on tour uh, doing our live shows again. And we're really excited to um, see you on the road. So we will be in a city near you. So stay tuned for those tour dates coming out. But this will give you just kind of a taste of of what a live show is like. So much fun. You can find Shan on Instagram at Shan Booty. And she has the book, The Game of Desire out, which mm-hmm. is your guide to dating all of the things. Um, we've actually had an interview with her previously on Almost 30 Podcast. So if you want to get into that conversation, I highly suggest you do it. You can search Almost 30, Shan Booty, and it will pop up. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening. We love you. Um, just a few announcements before we go. We do have our retreat coming up in May in Malibu at the Calamigos Guest Ranch. Can't wait to see you. You can find more information almost30podcast.com slash retreat. And I think that's it. And just thanks so much for your support. And anyone who writes a review, we read all of them, your DMs, your emails, truly it means the world. So yeah. thank you. Here to support you as well. And we'll see you on the other side. See you soon. Before we dive into this episode, I'm really excited to share that our friend, Jordan Younger, you might know her as The Balance Blonde on Instagram or thebalanceblonde.com, but she has a new healing program. And it's incredible. It's the 22-day detox your life. And this program is so comprehensive and thoughtful and supportive. Uh, It's not just throwing recipes at you and being like, good luck. It is truly a very, very foundational, supportive resource for you as you detox, as you you know, eliminate maybe salts, oils, sugars from your diet, as you step into a plant-based diet. I cannot say enough about Jordan's program. The program is 190 pages and has over 55 delicious plant-based recipes that you can make today, plus all of the information you need to transition to a salt, oil, sugar-free plant-based diet. It also goes deep into food combustion combining detox protocols for healing and her own Lyme healing journey. She's been so open and transparent about her healing journey with Lyme disease on Instagram. If you don't follow her, please do at The Balanced Blonde. And she also includes tips and tricks for eating a balanced plant-based diet and so much more. The cost is $111, which is such a bargain. There is so much in this program. And if you purchase before uh, the end of the day on February 14th, you will also receive 
three calls with Jordan, weekly meal plan emails, and a Facebook group to join. If you purchase after February 14th, you can still buy the program, but these add-ons will not be available. So visit thebalancedblonde.com for more information. You just click on the Detox Your Life tab. And again, the enrollment with these special add-ons closes on February 14th. And for our listeners, what's up? Of course, we have a discount. The code is almost 30 to get 10% off the healing program. So make sure you check it out, thebalanceblonde.com. Click on the Detox Your Life tab. Use the code almost 30 for 10% off. Who doesn't love a nut butter? Tell me. Chris and I are obsessed. This is like stocked in our office. Superfat is certified keto, vegan, and paleo nut butter that comes in convenient on-the-go pouches that are super easy to travel with, which we love. We have them in our purses, in our backpacks, in our freaking suitcases everywhere we go. And I didn't know this, but there are certain fats that your body can't make on its own, so you have to get them from your diet. And these are called essential fatty acids and a great place to get them, almonds and macadamia nuts. And this is what super fat uses to create create this delicious line of on-the-go nut butter snacks. And it, this is really great for feeling fuller, longer. This helps with energy, cognition. I just can't recommend it enough. My favorite flavor, let me tell you, is the super fat cacao mint nut butter. Just trust me on that one. Put it on your favorite toast. I like it on my cinnamon raisin bread toast. If you'd like to try Superfat, superfat.com, you can use the code ALMOST30 at checkout to get 15% off your first purchase. So I would stock up superfat.com. Use the code ALMOST30 at checkout to get 15% off your first order. This is our first live show in LA. Yeah. <laughs> And it's our last live show of the year. So we're really, really excited to close the year with our family here in LA. We've been on tour uh, all year, actually for the past two years um, on the road. And it's been incredible. We've been all over the world. We just got back from Australia. So y'all have friends in Australia. It's pretty crazy. Almost 30 Nation is alive and thriving all over the world. And it's just really beautiful to see. But yeah, it's been such a whirlwind. We're three and a half years into the podcast and it's become something so much more than we could ever imagine. So we're just really, really proud and really happy you're here. Yeah. And I want to give a shout out to our Phoenix girls who came. We love All the way from Phoenix. What the heck? We got eight of y'all Phoenix girls. Thank you so much for coming. (laughs) And yeah, if you guys don't know Almost 30 podcast, Lindsay and I started Almost 30 when we were transitioning from our 20s to our 30s. We're now over 30. So the joke's up about being almost 30. It's the joke that I hear every day of my life, actually. What are you going to do when you turn 30 and we're over 30? So that's what's happening. We're going to blow it all up. Yeah, we're going to blow it all up. Um, But we felt like we didn't have the answers to a lot of life's questions. I felt lost. I felt confused. And she was sort of in the similar boat where our late 20s, there's a lot of decisions that you're making that mean a lot to your future life. What career you're going to go into, who you're going to marry, if you're going to have kids, finances, body, all of those things. So we wanted to sort of bring the conversation to the airwaves. And what happened was a community was created. And that's really the basis of Almost 30 is the community of women and people that are a part of Almost 30 Nation and help create this wonderful world that we live in today. And um, we just, we're really excited, especially tonight. We haven't had a conversation like this in a live show setting, a a conversation around uh, sex and relationships and pleasure and flirting and all the things. So we're really excited to just get really juicy and vulnerable with y'all tonight. But, you know, Krista and I always like to kind of meet ourselves where we are when we start the live show and just kind of share what's on our mind and heart as it relates, especially to the topics that we're going to be discussing tonight. So take it away. And if you guys didn't expect, there was a lot of weird dates before I found Justin, who I've been with for seven years now, I think. I add a year. All I add a year each time I say it. I'm like, I think it's been 10 years just to like make it dramatic. So people are like, wow, that's a lot. Like, And so people don't think I'm crazy. So they're not like thinking I was pressuring it or like rushing it because your girl wasn't. Your girl was real chill and laid back about it, <laughs> which is one of my most proud moments that I was a chill future engagement person. 
But we had some weird dates before we found Justin. So do you guys want to talk a little bit about my weird dates? Because you know they're good because your girl's from Ohio. So if it wasn't weird boys, it was my brother. Because in Ohio, we just do it a little different. There's a little, there's a little, it's a little different. So it feels lucky to be here, first of all, for that fact. But in Ohio, we do a little different. One of my first favorites was definitely... So I'm dating a guy. And he's like, let's go on like a double date. I'm like, okay, perfect. I feel like I'm always wanting double dates, but they're never happening. So he's like, let's go on a double date with your friend Jackie. I'm like, okay, she doesn't have a boyfriend, but sure. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> whatever you say. So I'm like, okay, well, who's, who are we going to go with, with Jackie? Like, and he's like, my friend Tanner will come. I'm like, I know the name Tanner. I'm like, okay, cool. So it's me, it's, it's me him and Tanner and Jackie. I'm like, I'm like, what's going on? I'm thinking he starts to, I'm like, does he, I'm like, is this, is he starting to like her? I'm like, are we like starting to like Jackie? And then it was actually confirmed because he was like, I think we should switch. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So him and his friend had planned for us to switch the whole time. I know, it's, it's not that sad. It was like, I peeled out in my Honda Civic. I was like, fuck you guys. <laughs> Literally. It had like a tall spoiler. Everyone was like, that car's sick. I was like, I know. <laughs> so that was one that was very interesting. And then there was another one where I dated a guy and he ate a steak with his hands. Has anyone... Do you guys... Hot. Does anyone do that? I know. It was like... Can't tell if I'm turned on or grossed out. And it was at a, a Longhorn Steakhouse. But in Ohio, that shit's nice, to be honest. It was like... I worked at Outback Steakhouse for three years. I saw like 40 engagements. It was amazing. But anyway, so we're at Longhorn and he's like ripping it apart and he's like eating with his mouth. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I think that because it was a steakhouse, he thought he was like done. He's like, oh, it was like nice because it was a steakhouse. And then that was like all he needed to do was like the steakhouse in the name. And then he could just like free for all, like eat it with his hands. And now I'm vegan. So it kind of turned me. So I had the, the steakhouse one. And then there was one where... I got into the car with a guy. He's playing Dave Matthews Band, as you do, which was not the, not the problem. And he goes, okay, I'm going to... Uh, I have a surprise. I'm going to do a surprise location for the date. Which always is like, mm, okay. Like, I, I love the concept of the surprise dates for guys, but it's like, are they ever going to be like looking at Yelp reviews like we do and like looking at like the Instagrammable like Instagram ability of the location and like really understanding like I need everything gluten-free or like really getting the vibe of what you're feeling that night? No. So he's like, I have a surprise. He's like, do you want to guess? I'm like, okay. So I'm like, um, I don't know, but it better not be fucking Benny Hanna, which is like, yo, Benny Hanna is in Hamilton, Ohio. Benny Hanna was like the shit to be honest. And I actually don't know where my angst against Benihana came from. I was like, I don't know why I was like angsty against it. I think I was just like trying to create like a hierarchy of restaurants in my head in like Ohio. I was like, I don't like Benihana. So we had to sit there literally through the whole hibachi grill. We're like around the hibachi grill all fucking night watching the chefs like throw radishes in their hat and like create like with the spatula of the heart. And they're like making the heartbeat in front of us. And we're like... Just like, oh. But one of my favorites was probably the guy that I dated that hooked up with my sis. Ohio, baby. Ohio, baby. Legend. And that wasn't even really the issue. But what was... That wasn't even like... I was like, kind of like, whatever. But the way that I found out is like a trick that I use a lot. And I tell all my girls to use a lot. It's like an interrogation tactic, you know, that they use in the military. So this is how you figure out if like they're cheating. So you like start really slow and you like ask questions. You're like, okay, so like, so like tell me about the night. Like, you know, who are you with? What were you doing? Like who was there? All of that kind of thing. And then you kind of get into it. And then you're like, okay, so like when did you join Al-Qaeda? Like when did you decide to like bear arms? And you kind of like really dig into it. But the thing is, is when they're like admitting like, oh, you know, I may be fell on her face and like we kissed because it was really dark, but she wanted it and I did it. You know, and they kind of like do that thing. You always say that you know that they fucked. 
You're always like, no, I actually know that you guys had sex. Because you always go, because no one ever just kisses. Like, no one's ever just kissing. Like, they're like, we just pecked. It's like, okay, we're adults. Like, no one's just kissing. So you always assume that you know that they fucked. And then you just say it. You're like, I actually know. I actually know that you guys fucked. So if they say kissed, you say fucked. And if they say that they made out, you say fucked. And if they say that they fucked, you say anal. And if they, <laughs> and if they say anal, they've actually been fucking for years. And, and you should probably watch out. And this tactic has worked at 100% with every guy that I've dated that cheated. Always push him to the limit and say, you've been fucking for a long time. And it actually worked on the podcast with my mom. Yes. I actually didn't know. This is like secret, so it doesn't leave the place. I actually didn't know that my mom was like fully cheating on my dad. And then I just like said it on the pod. And she happened to listen, which needs to stop. <laughs> which I said a hundred times. I'm like, can you please not listen? Please. She's like, so I was having a great time listening to your show. I was loving it. I was like, oh, this is great. Her's talking about Justin. And then you aired my dirty laundry and literally like admitted it. And I was like, oh shit, this is working like all the time. I'm like, everyone is like fucking. I'm like, even my mom. I'm like, and I didn't even want it to work. I'm like, oh damn. Like I was like doing it for dramatic effect on the show. I was like, oh yeah. And then she like cheated on my dad. And I was like, dramatic effect. And then it was like true. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> now I'm like, now what do I do? Like, do I tell my dad? So it's been, you know, interesting dating all these guys. But they brought me to my sweet, sweet Justin, who, yes, very sweet. Who it honestly took me like four years to figure out that he like was nice. Like, I, he, like, I to believe it. Like, I would just wake up every morning and be like, like, is he like fucking with me? Like, can a guy just be like really nice? I was like, is he just nice? Is that it? And through the whole engagement process and like the wedding, it's been so interesting because, so I haven't done shit for it and I'm not doing anything. I'm just kind of chilling, but I keep asking everyone for advice. I'm like, what's your advice? Like, because it's just like an easy question. Like people want to talk about their wedding, whatever. And I'm kind of confused of like why everyone's doing it. Like, why is everyone continuing to get married when they like fucking hate it? I'm like, they're all like, oh. so it's really actually really hard. And they're like, we had to mortgage our house, remortgage our house. We had to take a loan out. And, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't do a big wedding. And I probably, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have a party. And I wouldn't do it here. And I wouldn't do it there. I'm like, you just got married like a week ago. I'm like, why are you, like, why is it so, why are we still doing these things that we hate? Like, everyone is like, finds it so stressful, but no one is like taking the action to make it not stressful and just like kind of do a party. And even when I was like working in the corporate world, even at like my first job, I would like sit there and be like, wait, so we have to be here every day? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you're 22. Like you're going to be here every fucking day. I'd be like, oh my God, no. <laughs> like I can't. Like, we have to go to happy hours together? I'd be like, oh my God, I can't. <laughs> and then the marriage part happens and they're like, everyone's like, marriage is so hard. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I don't know why. Like, why does it have to be so hard? I'm like, I remember seeing a post from Haley Bieber. It was like an interview. <laughs> it was like an interview with Haley Bieber. And it was like, it was literally a week after their wedding. She's like, they're like, tell me about marriage. She's like, marriage is really hard. <laughs> I'm like, yo, how? Like, it's literally been a week. Like, it should be hard later, I think. And I've always said, you know, when people ask for like advice about my relationship, if they ever want any, I'm like, you know, my number one tip definitely is like fear. I'd say all the ladies that are dating guys, your boyfriends are probably terrified of you, to be honest. I think Justin is scared of me 95% of the time. <laughs> Where like I come in and he's like, he's like literally so scared. He's like, okay. He's like, so she looks a little raggedy. That's normal. <laughs> He's like, okay, so hair is like kind of crazy, but that's normal. It's like, I don't see a smile just yet. So let's wait. Let's hold off. And then he's like thinking in his head everything. He's like, okay, did I text her back? Like, is the apartment clean? Like, 
all these things. And he's like, I propose. So, okay, I've got those points going for me. But he's just like waiting because he's so fucking scared of me, literally. And another thing, another one of my favorite tips is with meals, you know, have your dinners, have your candlelit romantic evenings. And for Justin and I, we go to two separate restaurants all the time. So we always have my vegan spots, his meat spots. Mine are like Green Goddess Collective, like Rainbow Child Juicery. His are like griddle in the middle, like these like basic ass places because we literally cannot go anywhere together. And that's how the pennies do it. You know, the sweet pennies, which is our nickname for each other, which actually stands for penis. It's true. We call each other Penny, which stands for penis. So we'll do like Penny Hana, Pen and Jerry's, Penny and the Jets, Benjamin Button. There's really like a lot you can do with it, but it's been amazing and fun. And Justin has been, you know, the biggest gift in my life. And going through this process with him has been incredible. I'm sure he learned a lot about me and my dating tonight, which he probably really didn't know. So I'm very thankful for that. And tonight, talking with Shan is just going to be a blast and a dream. I fell in love with her when we saw her probably a year ago on stage. And like, she had these like underwear on, was like, is she looked like Aaliyah. She had these like low pants, like cargo with these like Aaliyah underwear and just looked like a fucking baller. And I was like, I'm going to be friends with her. And I don't know if she thinks I'm her friend yet, but I'm trying really hard. <laughs> so it's going to be amazing. And I'm so looking forward to hanging with you guys. <laughs> I love those dating stories. Thank you. But I have to agree, Justin is the best. But I just want to thank you all for like formally having me as your designated single girl on Almost 30. (laughs) Yes. So yeah, three and a half years of the pod, but I've been single for seven. (laughs) If someone would have told me that I was going to be single for seven years after my last relationship, like calling the convent or joining a cult. Like, I'm done. That's pretty daunting if you think about it. If you were told, like, you're going to be single for the next seven years and you're like, fuck. (sighs) I thought I was going to be married by the time I was 28, have kids by the time I was 30, you know, the whole deal. But, you know, there's a different plan. But I felt like, you know, when I first was, I'd say the first three quarters of my singledom, I was really searching outside of myself for the answers, for the guy, for the life I was dreaming of. I mean, I was on all of the apps. I even was on... So I was on Tinder, met a guy, and I was living with my um, best friend who is gay. And he ended up seeing him on Grindr the next day. It's like one of those things where I was like okay, so this is how the apps work. You just got to have... It's like a filtering through numbers game. So I was on them for years. I would definitely just put myself out there and like do things I didn't want to do. Nothing crazy and inappropriate, but more just like settling on a regular basis. I was working in the bar industry. I was a bottle girl, sparklers in the air, lighting my hair on fire. And I met some really interesting characters. One in particular, I remember was snorting uh, pre-workout like powder on the table. I was like, don't you guys do Coke? Like, I'm confused. (laughs) But whatever. I was never offered Coke, by the way, in my entire life. I just like to say that out loud because I think it's weird and I'm kind of insulted. So if anyone has some tonight, just offer it to me, but I won't take it. (laughs) I'm still insulted. Like, I still haven't been offered and I don't know why. I got a compliment about my butt the other day from another female and I felt really good about it. I was wearing my power leggings from Sweaty Betty. They are bum sculpting and you can like wear them with any activity you do, whether it's yoga or high intensity, running, what have you. They're very, very versatile. And listen, this brand has been doing activewear forever. They know how to design it. They know what materials to use, the highest quality. They really flatter the female form and exude. Like they truly help you to exude confidence both during and outside of your workouts. And their goal is to make you feel really powerful. And they do. Their clothes are just so cute. The athleisure, like I can't do without. I bring it from like day to night and I really mean that. 
You know me. Um, but if you'd like to try Sweaty Betty, we have a discount. You can get $20 off your full priced order when you go to sweatybetty.com slash almost 30. Use the code almost 30 at checkout for 20% off your orders. Whether you need leggings or tops, bras, they've got you covered. Sweatybetty.com slash almost 30. Use the code almost 30 for 20% off your order. Something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals. I found at the age of 32, I was experiencing anxiety at such a high level. I was like, what is this? I'm an adult. I should be able to handle this. And it really helped to talk to a professional. Um, BetterHelp is an incredible service for those of you out there who maybe don't want to go to an in-person counselor or need a more affordable option. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 24 hours. This is not a crisis hotline. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. And they have a broad range of expertise, which you might not be able to find locally where you are. You will get timely and thoughtful responses from your therapist. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So it's really incredible. It's affordable. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So if you'd like to try BetterHelp for 10% off, you can go to betterhelp.com slash almost 30. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash almost 30 for 10% off your first month. I just gifted Cosbox to one of my dearest friends and she was so excited. This is a quarterly, four times per year subscription box curated by women for women that focuses on showcasing amazing products that are ethical, sustainable, and have a positive mission to give back and make a positive difference in the world. And that just like, I was like, yep, yep. I'm in. I'm in. Sign me up. I love it. I was so excited when I first got my cost box because it was filled with products that I actually use every day and truly adore and 70% off retail. It was incredible. So for example, I got this like amazing daily hair vitamin. I got a jewelry box. It was leather with like just a beautiful like zipper on it so that I could travel with my jewelry. I got these gold serving spoons that I use on the regular. Trust me, this box is incredible. If you'd like to try Causebox or gift it to someone, you can go to causebox.com and use the code almost 30 for 30% off your first box of jewelry, homeware, skincare, accessories, and more every single season and really raising awareness for local artisans. Yes, amen. Causebox.com, C-A-U-S-E box.com. Use the code almost 30 for 30% off your first box. So yeah, I just reached outside of myself for so long and it was fucking exhausting. And this last year has been interesting because I finally decided, as we say here in LA, I'm going to go inward. So I'm going to do some like self-development work. And I went all in. And as you do, you start off that inward journey by doing ayahuasca in Costa Rica. (laughs) So (laughs) Chris and I went to Costa Rica in March the two youngest like blondes we walk in they're like what the hell's going on like you should is this a mistake did you mean to go to like a wellness retreat i'm confused but it was one of the most beautiful experiences that i've had in my life went into it terrified i thought i was going to like shit some tra- childhood trauma and like barf out ex boyfriends and things like that um cuz there's like a major purging process if you don't know what ayahuasca is it's plant medicine mother ayahuasca And it's really beautiful. It's really intense and kind of crazy. But we did four nights of it, four nights in a row. Your reaction is right. Yeah. We thought the same. We were like, four? (laughs) (laughs) Like, isn't one enough? Yeah, it was was pretty intense. And before the ceremonies, we would set an intention. On the first night, I was kind of like, okay, just like, I just don't want to die. Like, let's have a good time. Like, give me a good trip. And um, second night, I was like, no, I have to be more specific. So I I was like, okay, mother, I I took the drink, sat down. I'm like terrified that I'm going to puke it up before it actually hits my system. And I'm like, mother ayahuasca, like show me the meaning of why I've been so lonely for the past seven years. And so I went to sleep um, as you do. And she paralyzed me. I was like completely paralyzed in my body, um, which was interesting. I will... I will in, insert this part of the story. Before I sat down, 
I had a sweet man next to me. His name is John. He's a farmer from Minnesota. He's 70 years old doing ayahuasca. We were the youngest ones there. There was like, it was, it was kind of beautiful because I was like, can my parents come next year? Like, this is crazy. Um, but John had recently gotten a divorce from his wife of 45 years and was so depressed and had turned to alcohol and weed and to numb himself. And his kids sent him to Rhythmia where we were. So interesting prescription, but hey, let's go for it. So John had laid next to me the first night and then he found his way to me the second night. So I was like, okay, cool. Very sweet. (laughs) Sweet, cute baby blues. I was like, maybe, you know. Um, So he's to my right. You know, we we take the medicine. We're in we're in the zone, and I have a trip where I'm paralyzed. And I really, you know, I realize as Mother Ayahuasca is like bringing me all these scenes from my past relationships and showing me fully and completely why they were in my life. Um, which you don't have to do ayahuasca to find out. By the way, you could just do a little journal reflection. Everybody. <laughs> It's fine. (laughs) Um, But it was really beautiful. I I completely know and felt exactly the the divine timing of every one of those relationships and the why and how it either broke me down to build me back up or built me up and filled me up. So super thankful for that. But when I woke up, I'm still kind of paralyzed. Every night, Krista was like, where's Lindsay? Is she paralyzed again? Like, what the hell? It was kind of scary. Um, so I'm like slowly like uncrackling my body. I'm like, oh God. And then John like turns over. He like lays on the side of his body. <laughs> and he's like, he's just staring at me. And he's like blinking kind of slow. He's like. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, fuck. And I kind of knew in the moment, but I, I'm a good actress sometimes. So I'm like, I'm like, hey, John, how was it? <laughs> like. Tell me about your journey, man. And he's like, it was amazing. And I was like, cool. Uh, Any highlights you want to like give to me before I like go back? He's like, "Mm, I want to talk to you about it tomorrow. I was like, oh, fuck. So we have like pull time the next day and eat like grass and stuff. And he pulls, he goes over to Krista because it's high school. You know, you got to go to the friend to talk to their friend. Sweet John. Like, he was literally. also a in, member in front of everybody. Oh, the entire fuck. group. Yeah. We were in a, we were in a, a public group. Yep. And he's, do you want to? Yeah. So we're in a public group and you talk about your journeys and everyone's like, I saw a hundred aliens and I saw <laughs> like God. And Lindsay's in the front row and John's right behind her. And I go to the bathroom. So I'm like in the back and I'm like, okay, hanging out. And John raises his hand and he goes, I actually fell in love last night. And and I am like... And literally, it brings me right back to high school. Because you know in high school or middle school, I have like... There's like a trauma there for me. Like these two twins wanted to make out with me and they told the camp counselor and they're like, I'm going to make out with her. And they're like, yeah, dude, go for it. And I was like, "Ah," like, I don't want that attention. I don't want that weirdness. So her, him talking to Krista, I was like, no. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, no. I'm not 14, but um, John's 14, I think it is in his heart. But eventually I was able to tell John, I said, you know, maybe John, like the experience you had where you saw me in your journey. (laughs) I just always wonder what I was wearing. I'm like, what am I doing with John? You know, sledding. I don't know. (laughs) He also said, are you taking the almost 30 tour to Minnesota? And I was like, now I'm not. <laughs> no. <laughs> he was like, I know that I'm old. I'm like, yo, that's the least year problem, John. <laughs> so, but <laughs> I told him, I said, you know, it's really beautiful because I think what that feeling was, was that you, like your heart is open and that you're able, you will be able to love again. Because I think you just felt like he didn't have it in him anymore, you know? Um, I know. So sweet. He's so sweet. And that, you know, that's what kind of put me on this, like being the observer in this part of my life and really just like noticing and honoring the moments that I'm learning so much about myself and also about other people and allowing more and being open to more because so much of my life and so much of that single period was like reaching outside of myself and forcing and settling and all the things. And the allowing and just kind of being this observer of life has really like opened my heart. 
says my Reiki master who tells me my heart is now open. So, <laughs> woo! Yeah, it's good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step down as like your, your token single girl, if that's okay. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so John's moving to LA yep. and it's going to be amazing. It's time. <laughs> yeah, honestly. I could be a young mom with an old dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. We're so excited to hang with you guys tonight and welcome Shan Boudram to the conversation. She is a world-renowned sexologist. She's a YouTube stunner and star. And she's, she is the author of The Game of Desire, an incredible new book, which they are selling in the lobby. Please grab one. It is so damn good. I don't even like... We'll talk about it, but I'm just so honored and in awe of you always. So let's welcome Shan Boudreau. Welcome, sis. Thank you for having me. I, I wish I was wearing Aaliyah underwear today. Same. How fine was that? That I was a moment. I'm sorry. The boots are fine. Yeah, the boots are fine. Yes, yes. Here we go. You got these boots. Oh, okay. I say boots today. Yes. <laughs> so we are so excited to have you. Hello, lovers and friends. Yes. If you guys know her YouTube, yes, I watch her YouTube. I like keep up on it every day. <laughs> but we're so glad to have you. I just really respect what you do. And I love that you're a pioneer in the space. And I love that you're so vulnerable and open and honest. And your man's is here. My husband's in the audience. Husband today. in What's the up, audience. Jay? And his so two he, friends came too. Yes. You love love the friends. Audience. We can vouch for everything. Can I just start by saying how incredible that was to stand up there and to share your truths and to be funny and empowering and cool. And I honestly feel like we should stand for the entire show because your legs look so fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah, It looked amazing. <laughs> This is my non-cellulite leg. The other one, <laughs> the other one's got a little, got a few things going on. <laughs> so we're good right here. Um, I'd love to talk about, you know, just for our audience to kind of get grounded in you and, and your background and being a sexologist. What was your journey to become, you know, who you are and do what you do? Because it's one thing to be interested in dating, love, relationships, communication, all of the things that you do. But it's another thing to be an expert, to write books, to speak on the topic, and to be especially a female woman of color in the space. So I'd love to talk about your journey to becoming Shan Boudram. Yeah. You know what, actually? I, I don't know if we talked about this last time on the podcast, but what did you want to be when you were young? Like, what were you really great at? What was your thing? I just said whatever people would want me to say. I was like, they're like, you should be a pharmaceutical sales rep. I'm like, that's what I want to be. At five, that's what you wanted <laughs> you to know, be. Literally, they're like, Ohio, ladies and gentlemen. I, like, <laughs> I wanted to be the first dancing tennis player. <laughs> this outfit, though? This that's outfit it. is the perfect Christmas dancing tree. tennis yes. outfit. <laughs> Um, I think a lot of the times we think of purpose as something we have to find and go towards. And for me, it was rediscovering what my purpose was. Like, I genuinely think that I was born to do what I now do for a living, which sounds weird if you put it in a five-year-old context, but um, I genuinely... Honestly, I remember... You play with toys, you had like dildos. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my first sexual experience at five with a pillow... But I remember it being positive. Like me and the pillow had like consensual talks. It was it was really like, and um, it was at a sleepover. My friend went and told on me and I got in trouble for it. Loser. And then after that day, my Barbies were banned from being naked because they were very liberal. They had the grocery store naked. Like they would always have no clothes on. So I was just really fascinated by the human body at a very young age. I was very fascinated by human touch. I just, I loved love. And I also grew up though in a Caribbean household. I went to a Catholic school. So all of those natural passions were fucking squashed, right? Mm -hmm. It was really suppressed. And when you go through that kind of suppression, two things happen. Either one, you go to a convent, you become a nun. Or number two, you look for backdoor ways. And I was a backdoor motherfucker. So I watched tons of porn. I read a lot of fiction novels. Uh, Gossip Girl informed a lot of my ideals around sexuality growing up. And needless to say, I had a really terrible teen sex life. And there was this thing that I had been looking forward to or thought about my whole life that when I had an opportunity to engage in it, it was awful. And then I had another crossroad moment. Either I can give up and say, this is actually terrible and, and the, the nun was right. This is the worst thing in the world. My parents were right. Or I can decide to re-educate myself. And when I did re-educate myself, I went to a library for an entire summer and read every book possible. And it dawned on me that sex education is bad sex. Right? It's good. I mean, it's, it's great information and it really did change me, but it was dry. It was monotonous. It was boring. It was predictable. It was slow. And so I'm like, can there be somebody who makes sex education sexy? And so I saw a hole and I filled it and here I am 
15 years later. That's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, I'm curious about like your, you know, that dating life, whether teens, 20s, and what that looked like just to inform, you know, the way that you connect with people now. Yeah, I think in my early years, one, I remember the gym class, the sex ed teacher, and I remember her talking about the clit, but everything was like this motion. It was like, this is the vulva. That's the vaginal opening. This is the anus. This is the clitoris. And like my interpretation of that was the clitoris was a button inside of the vaginal canal that only the right penis would be able to find. So I spent some time looking. Um, and I also just never really learned or about saying no. I also learned, I also didn't understand that sex wasn't currency. So I feel like a lot of my sexuality was searching through other people and not really knowing what was right for me and waiting for there to be this partner who would unlock this potential I felt I had. And that obviously led me to a lot of people who want to take advantage of me. So I think about my teen sex life, it was just a lot of partners, a lot of heartbreak, zero orgasms. Um, and I'm grateful for that in some ways because it led me to what I do today. So disrespectful. Those early relationships. Just before we get more into like the sex relationship stuff, I do want to talk about you in this space that you are. Because me watching you, I do see some of the discrimination that you get just being a young female woman of color doing your role. Because I think people assume that if you are a sexologist or if you are an author, you have to be an old woman or an old man. Or, you know, they have this ideal stereotype of what that person looks like feels like, acts like. So what has that experience been for you? And what is your journey now making peace with that? I think um, I acknowledge I'm disruptive. I'm a disruptor, right? Like I think even at 19 years old, when I began this journey, it was a really disruptive thing to do. Like my parents would definitely tell you that shit. <laughs> I am not, again, and I'm not who looks like the archetype of in this space. And I also want to make it what it hasn't been before. I mean, I, not, there, there are a lot of great educators out there and I'm a big fan of a lot of sex and relationship ed experts. But I think that this is supposed to be a fun space. It should be inviting. It should be explorative. Talking about sex should be just as fun as fucking, right? Talking about dating and love should be just as interesting and explorative and just engaging as actually doing it. So I rely on some not so scholarly ways to bring my message apart, or bring my message up. I think that intimidates people and I can understand why. And especially again, if you've gone through 20 years of your life being told this is a bad thing, you're not supposed to talk about it, you're not supposed to do it outside of the bedroom, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to, and then you have somebody who's on stage wearing a vibrator necklace and thigh high skin, like snake skin boots, it doesn't, it feels disruptive to you. And so I think that I've come to peace with it because I'm like, everybody's journey is different and I'm trying to push people along a little faster and people don't like to be pushed, but I have seen beautiful things come out of the work that I do and there's so much more positive than negative, but I think that the negative is just a natural byproduct of being one of the first. So my big message is I want everybody to be a sex and relationship expert. I want everyone in this audience to be like, I know what anal plugs best for you, you know, or I know what kind of relationship structure will be best suited for you. Like, I want everybody to feel like this is an area that they have got authority in. Because we're not talking about something that's obscure like carpentry, although if you are a carpenter, shout out to you. But we're talking about this thing that we all do. You guys told these beautiful stories in the beginning, right? And so why shouldn't we all know what we're doing? And I think for that reason, I can't find where my point was, but... So I want y'all to be experts. That's that we all need to be experts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, growing up, I grew up Catholic. I don't know if anyone grew up Catholic, but in Ohio, baby, yo, we were not talking about sex. That's for damn sure. So even coming into the space with the podcast has been super interesting to have people like you on and have other experts on because I still feel myself being like, oh, you know, like being like, hmm, like a little, I will say whatever, but the sex area sometimes makes me a little like, I catch myself just back in that place where I am the girl from Ohio that grew up Catholic that couldn't really talk about sex, pleasure, self-love, self-pleasure, and all of those things. So your work has been really impactful for me in that way. But that's great too. I also love people who acknowledge that this is a space they want to keep private. I think that sometimes what we do in the sex positive community is like we try to force everybody to like step outside and be your yeah. best self and you know wear less clothes. And for some people, it doesn't feel like a celebration of your best sexual self. I think my message is, no, it's like school, right? For school, we went through 18 years of learning about various different topics in a low-risk environment with the help of an authority. And through that process of elimination, you were able to make an educated decision about what career is best suited for you. 
But when it comes to sex and love, we don't do any of that. We just throw people out there and we say like, good luck. So I... I love to meet people who are like, you know what actually is best for me? I just, I'm a monogamous person. I am not very sexually freaky. I'm missionary Monday through Friday. And then Saturday might do a little doggy. And that's pretty much my, my lifestyle. That's I a love lot of that. fucking though, to be honest. That's a lot of fucking. <laughs> I mean, that sounds good. <laughs> Speak for that's yourself. That's a lot of fucking. <laughs> um, I love what you said before about, you know, really kind of cultivating that conversation outside of the bedroom too. Because I think... Again, a lot of us don't feel comfortable having that conversation. But then if we want to say anything, it's happening in the bedroom. And it's not really the time to have like a grounded conversation. So I guess my question is like, what does that look like outside of the bedroom? Like what... How can someone start a conversation like that or and involve their partner? Because I'm sure one of the two in a couple might be a little bit more uncomfortable than the other. So like, what does that look like? I can probably pass the mic just Oh, now. I ain't like, answering that. Okay. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know that one. <laughs> I think that uh, communication is a culture, right? It's not something that you just pick up and do. And I, so I think whenever we call it the talk, we do a disservice to it because it has to be the ongoing conversation. And the more that you talk about, it, the more comfortable that it gets. And again, it's kind of going back to that. Talking about sex should be as fun as having sex, Right. So it can be flirty, like what turns you on? Like what's the most exciting thing that you've seen? What's the freakiest porn category you've watched? Like when's the last time that you got tested? Because I actually, (laughs) I went a couple weeks ago and you know, I was also looking pretty good. Like it can be, it can be fun and engaging. Like mine aren't. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, I'm not sure yet. (laughs) I have to say when Shan's asking these questions, you can't see it. Maybe you can demonstrate. I mean, the look down and up that she's doing makes me want to tell you when the last time I was tested was. Do you have HSV1 or HSV2? I'm really into it. (laughs) Just, it doesn't have to be stiff and awkward. And I think a lot of the times too, when we think about talking about sex, we default to what we don't like or how we need things done. Versus if I'm telling you what I love and what's been great, it's actually almost natural for me to say, and I, I go by the yuck versus yum. Um, that's like my tactic for talking about sex in general. You can tell somebody like, yuck, like you fuck like a rabbit. Or you can say, yum, like I really love it when you go slow with me. Like you're really intentional and you hit me in the, all the right spots. Like that's my favorite thing. And so the positive reinforcement thing can massively be helpful. But all in all, it's the more that you talk about it, the easier it gets. I am a prime example of that. Like my filter is so broken. I can be at brunch talking about fisting and I would not even register that that's not normal. So if it doesn't feel comfortable for you... You're like, listen up. So he's going to squat on you and shit on your chest. <laughs> and they're like, pancakes are like being placed on the table. They're like... <laughs> 100. You know, the first time that you, you know, that you built a piece of furniture, it was awkward. The first time you did a layup... Who builds furniture? <laughs> Ikea. I was talking about my Ikea folks, right? <laughs> Um, the first time that you do a layup, the first time that you do winged eyeliner, everything is going to feel unnatural until the muscle memory is built up. Um, I think one of the greatest fallacies that we share is that communication is key. Like, communication is the key. And then you're like, well, there's a lot of bad communication out there. I think that saying communication is key is identical to saying like, oh, the key to good art is paint. It's like, no, paint is the medium. It's how you use it. It's the skill that it's, it's actually... Um, utilize that makes something good or bad. And so not all communication is good communication. It is a skill that you have to learn, something that you have to work at. I mean, you don't just wake up having the language to express yourself perfectly. So if you're not great right now, that's okay. You can practice, you can get better at it. There's definitely a learning curve. And I am a product of that 1000%. Yeah, that's my future book that I'm going to write is going to be about language and how women and females have so much more of a vocabulary as it relates to our emotional intelligence that we seem like we are more emotional, but I feel like men don't have the vocabulary to express their emotions. So it seems like they're less emotional than we are. And if they were given that vocabulary, if they were socialized with that vocabulary, that men would be just as emotionally apt as we are. So that's my book. Don't fucking take it. Shout out to your book. I know. Do we get an exclusive announcement just now? Yes, that's exclusive announcement. Don't fucking take my phone. (laughs) You know what's really great? Because we had this conversation in the podcast where I don't remember which one of you was saying that you were in a relationship where the other person just didn't want to have these emotional discussions or just... Because you can want to communicate with somebody who's just not the willing partner and you can want to have these intellectual, sexy, fun conversations and the other person just kind of like dries up. You're like, okay, now what? And I was explaining that, you know, when you're playing a sport with a kid, 
right? You're not going to go 100% and dunk on their ass. You're going to be like, they're learning and they're getting new skills. So you almost have to play down to their level to gain their confidence. So if every time you're having a conversation with somebody, especially you guys are experts, you know, you're undeniable experts to me, it's very intimidating. So you, you almost have to go down to their level to build that confidence up and make it enjoyable and fun. Going back to that at all times, like, this is supposed to be pleasurable. Like, let me tell you guys something. We don't need you to fuck. There's enough people on the planet. Like, we're good. If you're going to have sex, do it because it brings you joy. If you're going to couple up, do it because it makes you a better person. You can provide value to somebody else. Like, you don't have to do anyone else a favor and, and force yourself into this. So have fun at it. Like, and that's, I even love what you said about marriages not being work, relationships not being work. Like, I, it's, there's a difference to me between like challenging and hard work. I think that it's supposed to be a fun, awesome, reciprocal, mutual, wet, juicy, sexy, hot, just enjoyable part of your life. And if you sit with that at your core and through everything that you do, I think you'll get that coming out on the other side. Yeah, I guess what to that question or to that point, what is your balance with that? Because I do hear that quite a bit where people are like, marriages work and I haven't been married. And I see where their point is and I see where they get that sentiment. But I do wonder how much work it should be together. You know, how much work are you doing on yourself before you come to that person or how much work are you doing together? So do you have any thoughts on, you know, the balance between really, really working for the relationship or allowing it to be? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the one plus one equals three. So one healthy relationship with self plus one healthy relationship with self creates a dynamic for their separate relationship together. So I do believe in the one and one. I don't, I think it's massively important to work on yourself. One of my favorite TED Talks talks about the three tent poles of a healthy relationship are self-insight, emotional regulation, and mutuality. That means that two-thirds of healthy relationships have to do with your ass and my ass, right? The majority of the work does come on you. But I think that the work is... I, I go by the 80-20 rule, which is a, my husband. That's that's his um, thing. I'll give a shout out to you. I usually don't credit Good you job, because you're sitting here. It'd be awkward if I didn't. So... <laughs> 80... He's like, at enjoy Jared Burns. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually this like viral quote that he had that he said in a video that I get credit for all the time. And it gets reposted on every major quote site. I'm like, fuck yeah. But 80% of the time, it should be reciprocal, fun, enjoyable, all those amazing adjectives. And 20% can be challenging. And that's important too, because we can't grow and evolve if we're not being challenged or pushed in some ways. But I think that that's the challenging work. I think hard work sounds like 50-50 to me. Hard work sounds like 60-40. Traditional guidance with fertility has been just wait and see, but now we have tools to help us plan and track everything in our lives like finances, steps, careers, school. So why is fertility still wait and see? Come on, people. That's why Modern Fertility was created. It's the easy and affordable way to test your fertility hormones at home with a simple finger prick. Mail it in with a prepaid label and you'll get your personalized results within 10 days. I mean, traditional testing with your doctor can cost over $1,000, but Modern Fertility only costs $159 to get the same information. And if you go to modernfertility.com slash almost 30, you get $20 off your test. And if you have HSA or FSA, you can use those dollars on Modern Fertility. You'll get the insight into how many eggs you have, hormone levels, and any reproductive red flags. The results go in depth into what every hormone means. And you can also talk one-on-one -on -one with a fertility nurse to review your results and options for next steps. Right now, Modern Fertility is offering our listeners $20 off the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash almost 30. That means your test will cost $139 instead of the hundreds of thousands it could cost at a doctor's office. Get $20 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash almost 30. I feel like I'm never not on mushrooms. Uh, Four Sigmatic is our tried and true. This is a staple in our lives in the office. And they use the magic of adaptogenic mushrooms to help you basically just optimize your health, your sleep, your gut health, your energy, your morning routine, truly. I love their mushroom coffee mix. Their dark roast ground mix is my favorite. I'm French pressing right now, everybody. Don't worry about it. But they also have really easy to travel with and easy to use uh, packets of their lion's mane, of their chai latte, of all of their mixes that you can take with you on the go. They mix with hot water super easily. I definitely recommend going on to foursigmatic.com. You're going to be shocked. They have so many incredible products that you can incorporate into your daily life. 
Reishi cacao at bed. That's all I'm going to say. Don't sleep on it or sleep on it, actually. Forsigmatic.com slash almost 30, F O U R, sigmatic.com slash almost 30, and then use the code almost 30 at checkout for 15% off. That's forsigmatic.com slash almost 30. Use the code almost 30 at checkout for 15%. Off. And I, I equate it to almost like a job. Like, you know, when you were at that desk job and you're like, every day I have to be here. And I'm sure your job now is very challenging. But there probably isn't a day that you ever think to yourself, like, the rest of my life I'm at this shit, you know, because you knew what was best for you. You put in the work to design a role that you knew would be a celebration of the best parts of you. So I think that if you do the work for yourself, you align yourself with the right relationship that, yes, can be challenging, but will never feel like hard work. Yeah. And I think just a last point on that. For me, it's like the relationship, of course, will be work, but I focus on my work first. It's always me. It always comes back to me because whatever's happening is a reflection of what's going on inside. So the work that needs to be done within my relationship needs to be done with me first. And then you can kind of go to that person. So yeah. And related to the work, I think too, like for me, I've had to increase my tolerance of like challenging situations because a lot of times I'm like, oh, this means it's not going to work. Like the fact that it's not like good all the time means that I should search elsewhere. I think it a lot has to do with just kind of how I grew up and how I saw people fight and not resolve the fights. And that always scared me. So I'm like, let me find something that has no fights or no challenging um, situations. So, you know, in terms of like how our upbringing, how our parents really influence who we are in relationship, can you speak to that, whether your experience or with the people that you've worked with for the book, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, like we are creatures of habit one and we uh, people will choose familiar pain over like unfamiliar. So I think that we look to repeat a lot of the ways that we experience love growing up. That's also a, a call for compassion for others. Like even when I, I talk a lot about toxic mind games and relationships and I, I, lo- I love breaking them down and giving the recipe. I think it's just so fun to fuck up people's games. Uh, but that the one thing I say in that is you have to be mindful that even though people are using these strategic ways to manipulate people into unhealthy relationships, they're mostly doing it because they believe this is the only way to express love. That this is the way that they observe. They saw an uncle or they saw somebody, it could be an aunt. Um, They saw someone in their life do it and this is how they're repeating it because they think this is how they make connections. And so a lot of it is uh, a one for yourself to analyze, but also two to be compassionate when you see someone not loving the best way. But yeah, we absolutely do try to repeat the, what we've seen before in the past. And that's why therapy is an incredible way to break the cycle. And I'm so glad to be part of the generation who's starting to realize that. So shout out to you, who I'm sure most of you guys go to therapy. If not, clap for yourself anyway. Therapy, baby. Woo! Do you guys remember the book, The Pickup Artist? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you remember that book? Yes. It was literally the stupidest fucking thing. Uh-oh, she's going to challenge it. I kind of love it. Oh, what? what? Do you guys hate that? I love it because I think my book, The Game of Desire, yes. um, the main thing with that book that was so important for me is that I wanted to give people clear-cut strategies. So I think the one thing that men do well is that when they give advice, it's like a manual. It's like, do this, put yes. this here, here are the parts in there are necessary. And women, it's a lot of theoretical. Like, be, be confident, which I yeah. hate that. Like confidence is not a choice, it's a result. You cannot decide in this moment, like I'm going to be amazing at cooking. Bitch, if you don't know what you're doing, that will burn. You can't just decide to be great at something, right? You have to work towards it. So I like Pick Up Artistry for the fact that it gives people a clear step-by-step instruction. It doesn't like let you off the hook to figure it out for yourself. I dislike that they don't put self-work in the front of it. And they like neg women. Oh, Remember yes. that? It's like, yes. it was like, First, what you got to do is like go into a bar and you have to like neg her. So it's like you build her up, then you break her down and then you build her up and then you break her down. So she becomes addicted to the cycle of like your fucked yes. up. I swear. I swear. Like a neg would be like, oh, like your your shoes are, your, your feet are so big. You must not have back problems. <laughs> but exactly. And you're like, is that a compliment or an insult? But yeah, yeah. you're like, what? Tell me more. You never <laughs> want the experience of... Love, I, I always say to people, like, there's two ways. Like, um, you can get somebody, for example, if you're at a store, you can pressure someone into buying something and they're going to walk out of that store feeling like, shit, I didn't really want to buy that, but that person was a great salesman. 
Or you can make a really good product and know how to market it and create an experience that they actually enjoy afterwards. And so I think a lot of people learn how to make people fall in love with them because they think that's the only way. Mm-hmm. Wherein you can actually make someone fall in love with you by being kind and making them feel good about themselves. And they'll keep coming back because it was a mutual reciprocal experience. They actually got to see the best parts of themselves mirrored through you because you were showing them the best parts of who you are. I just think, again, it's just poor uh, education. And I appreciate the intent that's there because they do want to connect, but they just haven't bought my book yet. But yeah. we can fix that yeah. in the lobby. It yeah. is so good. And I want to talk about the book. In the book, you talk about um, dating with dominance, which I really love. Can you, for everyone in here who's dating, single dating, can you describe what that is? What that yeah, looks like? Getting to the driver's seat. I don't necessarily mean like five o'clock. Me up. Like I think people hear that when they hear dating with dominance, right? Like it's really, it's not that. <laughs> it's just be in the driver's seat of the encounters that you want. Um, don't wait for the right person to ask you out. Don't wait to find out if you, you should call the next day. Like if you set an intention forward. Like if I, if you told me you had a dream in career wise, and then you're like, I'm just gonna wait and see if the the right job finds me. And you're like. No, go on monster.com or go out there and put your resume and network. Like you, if this is important to you, and one of my favorite books, The Social Animal, says that two thirds of our happiness have to do with our relationships. You know, one third is about what you possess, what you own, like what you out, do out there in the world, but two thirds have to do with the quality and quantity of your relationships. So, why are women told to be in the passenger seat of the most important part of their life? So, dominance to me is just more like you're driving this. Like, this is your love life. Like, you should not be waiting for the right person to tap you or the right time. You should be actively guiding this ship. And I'm, again, we'll give you a clear strategy to do that. We're in LA. So I want to talk about polyamory and open relationships. Because I feel like that's been such a hot topic with like my friends and just people in our community. You know, they're like living their truth with like 100 partners. <laughs> so... What has your journey been with that? Like, I know that you were open before. Yeah. And now you're married. So I'd love to hear. Well, we started out as fuck buddies, which I just think was like such a beautiful foundation. It was one of those never say never things because I was like, I'm very, very much against them. And the first time that I had my... Which you guys said that you can't just kiss. Y'all, I'm the queen of just kissing. Jared <laughs> nudged me when he's like, see, you can't just kiss. Yes, you can. I used to just get my pussy eaten out and that would be the end of the night. Like I was a pro at that when I was single because... <laughs> for getting our pussies eaten. Just <laughs> managing expectations. So I went through a period of time in my life where I was coming out of a long-term monogamous relationship. Well, I'd say like one-way, one-way street monogamous on his end of the street. It was the Autobahn in Germany, just fine, fast and furious. Um, But I came out of that, but I was also in school for sexology during that time. And so I was in this really toxic relationship, learning all these amazing things, getting my confidence stomped on, my heart broken. I got chlamydia as well too. Shout out to you, you bitch. Um, So... I was... Happens to the best of us. (laughs) I was just like, when I came out of that relationship, I was just wanted to find someone to connect with physically. I knew that I had emotionally a lot of work to do and that I wanted to heal in a really intentional way, but I was so tired of having bad sex. And so I was auditioning dudes for a while. I would have them over to my apartment, play some Beyonce, wear a sports bra, and just like make out and kind of see where it went. And Jared was one of the people who came over. And I remember, Jay, he was uh, fingering me and he had this look on his face like he was painting. You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) it was just this like, he's so unfiltered and beautiful. And I was like, this is the dude I'm going to fuck. And uh, not that day, like maybe a week later, we actually did. But that's how our relationship began. And it was because I was so, again, intentional about what I wanted and we were very clear. And I just really loved it because it was so much less about who he wanted me to be and just a complete embrasure of who I was. And a part of that was also me exploring, you know, who am I in a romantic space? And I had been, again, monogamous for so long and I wanted to keep on dating and he was really okay with that. So when our relationship deepened, it just didn't make sense to start putting restrictions where we had just flourished so much in a situation without boundaries. And so it wasn't something that I saw for myself before, but it just really made sense based on my partner. And to be honest, it's like we're married now, but we didn't change the rules in any way. And we kind of like get um, debated on about this because nobody has actively gone outside of the marriage at this point, but it's a long life and 
to me, that's not at the top of my list of what it means to connect with somebody. Like what I look for in a connection is partnership. I look for touch, mutuality, and joy. And are our friends and family connected? Do we care about what's important to each other? Do we share values? Do we have a shared vision for long-term goals? Fidelity is not on the top of my list of things. So it's not something I just feel important about policing. But again, I also don't have a partner who was like my ex on the Autobahn. So that also helps things. But I will say that that I think is a really big part of... It's a beautiful thing to have a generation that has options for connection. And I think a lot of monogamous people look at non-monogamy as a threat. It is the savior because now you're not going to have people who are forcing themselves into a commitment style that they cannot adhere to. Because it's not sleeping with other people that hurts. It's the betrayal. It's the lies. It's the the, the deceit that happens. And so allow people to show you who they are. And I, I think a lot of the times asking somebody even very generally in the beginning of a relationship, like what level of commitment brings out the best in you? You know, how do you like to love? Like what's exciting for you when you think about coupling up with somebody or somebody's? And you can ask these questions in these non-judgmental ways. People can show you really important parts of themselves and you can make an informed decision if this is your person or not. I actually have a quiz that's called the Commitment Quiz. Um, It's been taken over 200,000 times. It's my most popular quiz. And 70%, there's 10 different results you can get. 70% are still monogamous, modern monogamous to be exact. So it is a very still monogamous society out there. I think we live in LA, it can seem like everybody wants multiple partners. Most people are just looking for one person, but at least now the choice is there for people. Yeah, we had Dan Savage on. I don't know if you guys know Dan Savage. The best. He's the man. It's terrifying, to be honest. So he's pretty famous in the space for being very vocal about, you know, open relationships. And the example that he used was if you are married for 30 years and you're the entire marriage, you know, we're not supposed to be monogamous as people. If you're standing on one foot and one day you put your other foot down, you're still really good at monogamy because for 30 years you were monogamous, but one day you put your other foot down if you were standing on that one foot because we're not supposed to be monogamous. And I thought it was a really beautiful example of being more forgiving of, of that process and being less judgmental of those who do cheat or stray or, you know, are not in monogamous relationships. And I love what you said just about meeting your partner where they are and like loving who they are rather than wanting to change them. That just like is a beautiful reminder. I don't know how many people can relate where you go into a relationship like, I can save you. I can fix you. You know, and it's like... Like makeover time. Yeah. (laughs) It's, It's exhausting for both parties. And it's really not the way to build a deep, personal, um, lasting connection because there's always that thing that you're looking to change. So I just thought that was beautiful. Okay, last question. But I do want to talk about, um, you know, the connection between mindset and sex. You know, and I think men and women are very different in this way, but I'd love to just kind of have an insight into both the masculine and feminine energies. We all have both. But just going into the bedroom and being cognizant of that because sometimes I feel like that is bypassed when entering the bedroom. And it's just like, we're going to do this. And so I think it's the biggest part and could add to the pleasure and the satisfaction and all of that. So let's talk about it. I feel like you have a personal story with this that I want to hear. I don't. Hear, girl. I, like, you know, <laughs> I don't. My whole life. <laughs> Well, I like for example, like dumb, like dumb relationships where it's like I just would always put my feelings aside. I literally would like never assert what I wanted or how I felt, and I felt like that was never felt by the other person. There was never a check in, like, "Hey, like I haven't heard from you, like how you're feeling and what you want." Like, let me check in with you. It was always just kind of them leading, and that really kind of built a resentment inside of me and just kind of blocked. Um, a part of me that like could potentially feel the pleasure, you know? Yeah, I think that is massively important to show up for yourself and advocate for your needs and to do it with a partner who's receptive to that. But also acknowledging that the heteronormative story that I think a lot of men are, you know, are shown that like the penis, you know, sex begins with a hard penis and ends with a flaccid penis, right? That's what we see in porn, as we see a lot of times in movies. And so that messaging is really ingrained into their brains. And so... I think that they actually feel a lot of pressure and would be grateful for a partner who came in and alleviated some of that because in their minds, like the penis has to like provide the orgasm and save babies and like rescue the world and stay hard for as long as possible and do it again multiple times. And 
they're, they don't know another way. And so I, I think it's important sometimes to kind of demystify that for a partner and say like, hey, like, here's what I like. Take the guesswork out of it or here's what feels good for me. And so I, I, I think it's, a, it's on both sides because I would love to, you know, just say it's probably just one or the other, but I do think that there are a lot of women who could benefit from speaking up and who are waiting for permission again, kind of in that passenger seat, who they probably have a partner who would feel really re- alleviated and really... Um, really happy to have you actually advocate for your needs. But there's also, yes, a sect of the population who doesn't want to hear any feedback again because they have this really singular vision of what sex is supposed to be based on the messaging that they were given. Both of those things can be broken down with conversation, with time. I don't think that you can necessarily have the best sex ever all the time. You know, the first shot, it can take some a while to build into that. Sexual incompatibility is in the end of any relationship. But yeah, if you want to see a change, you have to be the change you wish to see in the world. I That's think a beautiful quote. <laughs> it's it's Gandhi. But, yeah, I know, um, I know. It's Jared. But like, I'll take it today. Honestly, it's you're like Shan Boudreaux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that is exactly, exactly the feeling. You know, I think to empower each other, you know, in that in that way is just deepens the the potential, I think. Like, and what you said, like a quote unquote bad sex life is not the end of a relationship. You know, I think a lot of people think that and kind of use that as their marker. Uh, I've never felt that way, but like I, I can imagine, like a lot of people feel that where it's like, well, it's the uh-oh. language of sexual chemistry, yeah, right? There you like go. chemistry yeah. is just like elements; it's like solid state elements that come together that just don't work. Versus, like, it's not about chemistry; it's like compatibility, and compatibility is a work in progress. It's not a, like a steady state. So, if it doesn't work at first, it's probably just. And again, too, like so much of it. One of the most fascinating things I got to do with my YouTube channel is interview men about their sex life. Because I thought it was all the same. I thought any hole will do and it's all one size fits all for them. And it was interesting, a back-to-back interview I had where one dude was like, I want to give a PSA to all women, stop giving hand jobs. Like we we have enough, we've done enough on our own. We know what we're doing. Like we just don't need them. Thank you, but we're okay, ma'am. And the next dude I spoke to was like, I love hand jobs. He was like, I only come off hand jobs. It has to be a dry hand job. It's my favorite thing in the world. And I told him about the other dude, and he was like, tell him, bring the hand jobs to me. And so <laughs> that was also wow. Like, there's nuances for men too. Can you and imagine like, like drying off your hand. You're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just making sure you're extra, like, rusty. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I think sometimes we make the assumption for men as well too, right? So it's also about creating the culture that you want. If you want your partner to ask you, you may have to ask them. And it might take them a while to pick up on the hint, but yeah, creating the culture that you want in the bedroom can do wonders. Let's give lovely Shan a hand from this evening. Where can people find you? Tell them about the book and all the things. Well, I just want to say that I have lovely Bill who came out here to sell the books. And so Ooh. I want to support Bill in his like coming out for me. That was really lovely. So I'm doing buy one, get one free. So I bought books. And so if you buy one, I'm doing one that I paid in my own pocket and giving it to you. I also have a bunch of sex toys. Some of them are like upwards of like $100 retail. So if you buy two, you get a sex toy. Um, I will sign them all. I will show you love. But thank you for showing me love for having me here today. It is such a joy. And I love what you guys do in seeing you live. Like this shit right here, Netflix special. Yes, What's that? That's true. What's that? We love you, Shan. And thank you all for coming out. This is a thank dream. So we love you. We love you so much. Thank you so much to Sham Boudram for joining us for the LA Live show. Thank you to Big Beautiful Curves for opening the show and setting the tone. Thank you to the Dynasty Typewriter Theater in LA for hosting us. And of course, Almost 30 Nation. Thank you so much for showing up always. We had a blast with you and we're here to support you. Join the secret Facebook group. We're having conversations in there all the time, laughing, supporting one another, asking questions, being ourselves. And go to almost30podcast.com. You can check out information on our retreat coming up in May in Malibu. And of course, live shows later this year. Stay tuned for those dates and cities. And as always, we love you. Thank you so much for your support. We would not be doing this if it weren't for you. So until next time, love you.